Now it's recording. Ah. I do good. Mm. Mm. Hello and welcome to the Friends of San Pedro Valley Park Life Sciences Series 2021. I'm Mila Stroganoff, Program Director and Webinar Host. I would like to thank all of you for joining us for this, the first lecture of our series with Dr. Tom Parker. I would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all those people who helped promote this event. That was exceedingly kind and thoughtful of you and greatly appreciated. After our in-person lectures at the beginning of 2020, we had eight virtual lectures in 2020, five of which are recorded and available on our website. The website has lots of interesting things about San Pedro Valley Park, trails, descriptions, including flora fauna, many great photos, an archive of our newsletters going back to 2007, various articles, news bits, sightings, membership subscription for those who would consider supporting us by becoming a member. So take the time and check out the site. The Friends website is friendsofsanpedrovalleypark.org. Friendsofsanpedrovalleypark.org. So check it out. This lecture will also be recorded by permission of the speaker and will be found on our website in about two weeks when our IT team gets their hands on it. And I will take this opportunity to thank my husband, Adrian. I may be front of house. There's Adrian. <laughs> uh, I may be front of house as I like to call it, but he runs everything back of house. So without him, this wouldn't be working. <laughs> and we all know just how important time consuming that is. And now for some of the upcoming programs. I've been busy and I've gotten some program scheduled. So let's see. First off, on Saturday, February 27th at 4 p.m., the, uh, Dr. Natalie Nagalingam, Curator and McAllister Chair of Botany at the California Academy of Sciences will be with us. The program is entitled Botany of Spring. And I'm just going to read a short excerpt of the write-up. Um, it's spring, flowers are blooming, and uh, Dr. Nagalingam will help us take a closer look, a much closer look, at the different forms and structures of flowers that you will find in your garden, neighborhood, and park. She will discuss how pollinators such as birds, insects, and bats have co-evolved with flowers over the millennia how they fit and work together and the benefits that both derive. And she will also take a step back in history, discuss how certain plants were selected for medicinal purposes, and that may well surprise you. And as for the Victorians, they created a language using flowers as a means of communi communicating the most intimate of feelings. So um, Please join Dr. Nat Natalie Nagalingham to learn the botany of flowers, enhance your powers of observation, and appreciate the incredible variation you did not even know existed. So there you go, folks. You've got to come join us in February. Um, on March 27th at 4, we will have Dr. Doug Bell with a program on peregrine falcons. We have some pairs nesting at Devil's Slide, as most of you know. And Doug Bell is a fantastic and gifted ornithologist who knows all about peregrine falcons. I know him and my husband know him from way back when. He's senior manager with East Bay Parks and has long been associated with Cal Academy. And in April, April 17th at 4 p.m., the program will be presented by Akarok Weiss, Senior West Coast Wolf Advocate with the Center for Biological Diversity. She will discuss wolves, biology, ecology, their protective status or lack thereof, and much more. So three more fascinating programs to look forward to. So please mark your calendars. And now I have the distinct pleasure and honor of introducing our eminent speaker, Dr. Tom Parker. He is Professor of Biology Emeritus at San Francisco State University. Tom is an, evol is an evolutionary ecologist focused on the role of plants 
and ecological communities. He specializes in the dynamics of plant communities and has conducted research principally on tidal wetlands and chaparral. He has authored over 100 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, edited three books, and co-written the book, A Field Guide to Manzanitas, while teaching for 43 years. So, Tom, take it away. Hello, everybody. Um, it's an honor to be here and to not see you, I guess. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And... Uh, and hopefully everybody can see that. Okay. So I've been working with Arctostaphylus for whew, over 35 years. And I, I have a vivid memory of the very first time I was introduced to Arctostaphylus. I was a graduate student in Santa Barbara taking a Plants of California course. and. We went up uh, Refugio Canyon in the San Antonio Mountains and were introduced to Arctostaphylus glandulosa. And then the instructor got really excited and showed us Arctostaphylus refugioensis and said, this is endemic to this area and look how different it is. And I was looking at it and was like, I don't see any difference. <laughs> so it's been a pleasure working for them and now they all look incredibly different to me. But one thing I wanted to also talk about today is not just Arctostaphylus, but um, some of its relatives, because I think that puts evolution of this group into a better context. So this is a talk for the San Pedro Valley Friends, and I thought I would start by looking at the Manzanitas from San Pedro Valley County Park. And there are two of them. One of them is the endemic to the the northern part of the peninsula, Montera Mountain Manzanita. It's quite a lovely plant and it dominates a lot of the area near the Brooks Falls seat and in other places as you go further up the mountain. Classic Arctostaphylus with lots of the little flowers and the red bark. There is another plant that's a manzanita on the mountain, brittle leaf manzanita, Arctostaphylus crustacea. Um, one big difference is it has a burl, and that's a big enlarged piece at the base of the stem that can re-sprout after a fire. So you can tell them apart pretty easily. This, these pictures were taken on the 28th of December, and what you might notice is that the Monterensis is in flower, and the brittle leaf, Arctostaphylus crustacea, is not yet even swelling the flower buds. They both have these inflorescences that sit there for six or eight months before flowering, and they just stay dormant until uh, rainfall and temperatures permit them to go. But it turns out that one lineage of Arctostaphylus blooms well ahead of another, and Monteriensis are diploids, that means they just have one set of chromosomes from each parent. But Crustacea is a tetraploid. It has two sets from each parent. And it also is delayed in its flowering time in comparison to Monteriensis. They also differ in the way their leaves are. Uh, Monteriensis has heart-shaped leaves with little oracles, little earlobes at the base that wrap around the stem most of the time because the petiole is only a millimeter or two. Um, Crustacea, though, you can see over here, has quite a long petiole for a manzanita. The leaves have a flat base, more or less. And of course, Monterensis lacks a burl, while Crustacea has a fairly significant burl. Just in case you can't ever see what they look like. Um, the burls are these enlarged woody areas at the base of the plant. The stems come from the top and the roots come out of the bottom. And when the plant gets burned, all of these are dormant buds and they re-sprout after that point. So on Montera Mountain, they're often covered by moss, <laughs> which is not very common for uh, chaparral plants and other parts away from the coast. 
So my first quiz to you already is how do you tell them apart? I usually torture the audience when I'm doing this in person. You'll have to take the quiz on your own. But what I did want to talk about is how did we end up with such different plants? I mean, Arctostaphylos is a very diverse genus with lots of very minor, when you're first learning, uh, differences among the plants. Um, and they occupy all sorts of different geologies and climates uh, throughout the state. Uh, there's over 106 taxa, if you include species and subspecies. There are different ploidy levels, diploids and tetraploids, and that provides a bit of reproductive separation between them. Um, triploids, which would be the first generation hybrid, are usually inviolable. Um, there's also two different lineages in the, in the group. They're kind of like cousins, except they're so genetically distinct that um, hybridization is not very common. But within those lineages, hybridization is a very significant mode that initiates speciation in a lot of these groups. So sometimes two parents will come together and the hybrid progeny will be able to occupy a different climate or a different soil type, things like that. So you can see this is a very interesting group. Small clade has only about 15 to 20 taxa. The large clade doesn't look like it's very big, but then uh, this one little line here represents 35 different taxa. So genetically for this one gene, uh, there's not a lot of distinction between the groups, but um, there are definitely two distinct lineages. And if you start Wandering around the state, you'll often find just one species at a particular location, so no big deal there. But if you find a place where there are two species, it's usually going to be one individual from one of the clades, the big clade, and another diploid from the other clade. So the picture on the lower right is from uh, Napa County, and Arctostaphylos canescens, the hoary manzanita, and Arctostaphylos stanfordiana, the Stanford manzanita, co-occur in a lot of places in the Napa range. Okay, but they're from different clades and they don't have any hybrids uh, between them at all. Other places like on Montera Mountain, you can find two individual species together, but they'll be of different ploidy levels and hybridization is blocked by that difference. Now, if you're in any place from like Bolinas Ridge south to San Luis Obispo County and sometimes Santa Barbara County, you can sometimes find three species together. And in that case, it's almost always one diploid from one clade, another diploid from another clade, and a tetraploid. And so there are reproductive barriers and phenological barriers uh, that keep them from hybridizing too much. And so the species remain roughly distinct. Okay. Emphasis on that word roughly if you're just learning them. So evolution in Archistaphylus takes multiple pathways, different ploidy levels, different levels of relatedness because of the lineages. They're widely distributed and there's a potential for hybridization and there's variation in flowering time. But the details of that story I'll save for another time because I really want to talk to you about um, the family, the subfamily that it's in, the Arbutoidae. And we have examples of all the members of this subfamily in California, except for one of them. So th this is a early diverging group of the Iricaceae, which is the blueberry rhododendron family. And I know you're familiar with at least some of them. Madrones and manzanitas are pretty common throughout California, especially in Northern California. And those are two members of this little subfamily. But there are actually six genera. So the madrone that you're familiar with, there are actually 10 species globally. Uh, we only have one, uh, but there's a different species in Arizona, a different one in Texas, and um, five or six in uh, Mexico. And the Mediterranean region has another three. That's an odd distribution. Then we also have some summer holly. We have one here in the state, um, but there's a lot in Mexico. Uh, we have Ornithostaphylos and Xylococcus at the um, 
Southern California and in Baja, California. Lots of manzanitas. And then there's an odd genus, Arctos, which are alpine bearberries. And they're only found um, in the alpine zones far north and in the Arctic. So if we take a look at them, the madrones are called either strawberry trees in, the, in Europe or madrones in Europe and in um, California and Mexico. You're probably familiar with Menziesii. Um, we always think of them as having that classic orange red bark, but uh, a lot of the species have gray shreddy bark. Um, the strawberry tree that you might know as a horticultural plant has that gray shreddy bark. Its distribution is the west coast in Mexico, um, and then an area around the Mediterranean, the Canary Islands, a little bit of Normandy and the southwest tip of Ireland. Odd distributions, uh, glacial relics probably. Cumarus daphilus or the summer holly. Uh, Diversifolia is the one that we have in California, but there's a lot uh, to the south of us. Um, they also have succulent fruit, pictures of uh, Glaucescens fruit on the right side. And their distribution is mostly uh, to the south of us in Southern California, um, on the islands and in Mexico, going south. And there are the two interesting plants that, where there's only uh, a single species in each genus. Um, the Baja bird bush, Ornithostaphylus opposifolia, um, has smooth bark like Arctostaphylus and some of the madrones, but if you notice, it's uh, not bright red. It is uh, kind of off-white colored often. Um, it also has the unusual characteristic of multiple leaves at each node. Um, all the rest of the members of this group have a single leaf at each node. So that's where the species name comes from. The Mission Manzanita, Xylococcus, um, also Southern California. It produces similar looking flowers and fruit to um, all the other plants. I really like this one. And if you look at their distributions, you can see um, Ornithostaphylus barely crosses the border. Uh, Xylococcus makes it to Santa Barbara County and back into Baja. And of course, then there's Arctostaphylus. I know a little bit too much about this group to give you very many stories, but um, it's widely distributed throughout the world. But almost all of that distribution you're looking at is Arctostaphylus uva ursi. Um, we have that one in California, but it's mostly on the coast and the sand dunes and cliffs overlooking the ocean. Um, if you look over to North America, um, there's one species in Mexico, and that's Arctostaphylus pungens, the Mexican manzanita. And then way down in Guatemala is yet another Arctostaphylus uva ursi uh, relic population. Um, but that red area is where all the rest of the manzanitas occur, basically in the California floristic province. So you're looking at 105 of 106 taxa in that red zone. And finally, the odd genus is Arctos. There are two species, Arctos alpina and Arctos uh, rubra. Uh, they're both in North America, but alpina is uh, circumarctic, and it is found in uh, Eurasia as well. It was named by Linnaeus. Um, it's a different in that the leaves are thin. They die back at the end of the growing season and become those little uh, dry things right there. They don't often fall off the plant, they tend to accumulate. And the fruits are succulent and fleshy, like um, Arbutus. Very northern distribution and popping into alpine zones um, further down. Give you a flavor for this group. Um, the fossils are all found in Western North America. Uh, Arbutus fossils are found from Idaho south to um, Nevada. Um, 
And the oldest ones date past uh, 30 million years, about 32 and a half to 33 that are clearly Arbutus. Some fossils um, have been assigned to Arbutus that the paleobotanists still argue about. Um, that's a pretty old group. If you think about what the world was like in North America over 30 million years ago, uh, the, most of the West Coast wasn't actually here. Um, we have the North American plate moving west, the Pacific plate blocking it, the Farallon's plate moving as well. And then about 15 million years ago, we have the first Arctostathlus fossils appear, and this is the Miocene. And the 15 million years ago was called the, the Miocene Optimum. And it's a very warm period, but there was rain, so there was precipitation. Um, if you look at the close-up on the right, you can see California was mostly underwater at the time. Um, and all of the fossils that we're finding of Arctostaphylus are over here. So it was basically ready to be in California once we had a California. From the Miocene optimum, the climate warming peaked and it began to cool thereafter. And it also began to become much more seasonal. And that meant um, greater temperature fluctuations between the seasons. Uh, but also the summers started to dry. They were already dry a little bit in the middle Miocene, but they began to continue drying until we ended up with what we think of as our Mediterranean climate with almost no rainfall in the summer. Another thing was, um, as the continents were moving west, the North American plate, it, as it ran into the other plates, it caused the area in Nevada and parts of other adjacent states to lift up. So that there was basically a gigantic plain called the Nevada Plano that geologists speculate was over 5,000 feet. And that's where most of these uh, fossils are being found. 5,000 feet is under snow in the Sierra Nevada. So it was a really different kind of climate, um, even though it was dry and warm in the summer. And a little more background for the evolution of these plants is that multiple millions of years ago, we began experiencing glacial epochs. Okay. And for periods of 100 to 150,000 years, um, we would have glaciers over the northern part of the continents with little tiny interglacial periods of 10 to 20,000 years. So we're in the most recent interglacial, but humans have modified the climate enough that we may not get another glacial period anytime soon, at least. So that's sort of your background. They've been around quite a long time. The origin, based on fossil evidence, seems to put them in uh, Western North America. And they've had over 30 million years of chances to evolve. That's a huge uh, time period. So it looks like Arbutus was the first that's a modern genus. Uh, and if it's North American, that meant it would have to have traveled over to Europe to end up in the Mediterranean region. Three of the genera, Cumberstaphylus, Ornithostaphylus, and Xylococcus, would have retreated to California and uh, into Mexico as the climates shifted. Arctostaphylus and Arctos, basically Arctostaphylus retreats to Mexico and the coast. One species of Arctostaphylus and the genus Arctos moves north and invades Eurasia. So there's our group. Now th this little tree you're looking at just represents one hypothesis for the evolution of these plants in the sense that it's only a, a single nuclear area and that's, that gives you only a small probability of what's going on. Um, that group that's labeled out group at the top just helps us root the tree. And I've just highlighted uh, madrones that are North American. 
So what I want you to see is that the North American madrones uh, are the first to diverge, uh, the bottom of this lineage. And if you look up at the top, those are the Arbutus from Europe. So it makes sense that um, the North American uh, plants had to migrate over to Europe. But the really interesting thing is that little node tells you that the uh, Arbutus species from Europe are sister to all the other genera. So they have a common ancestor. And that's very interesting. It suggests that there used to be plants that made it over to eastern parts of North America. And during some time period, that group split and you ended up with Cumarostaphylus and Arctostaphylus, Arctos and Xylococcus um, going back to the west in Mexico and the other Arbutus fleeing to Europe. So this is a pretty old lineage. It dates from over 30 to 40 uh, million years ago. Six genera. Western North America is clearly the origin for the modern genera. Different life forms, different distributions, and other characters that are uh, different among them. And one lineage is much more diverse than all the others, and that's Arctostaphylus. So what I'd like to do is put you into the context of what would have stimulated all of this evolutionary uh, divergence. And one of the clear things is if you look at what the basal group is, Arbutus, they're basically woodland uh, forest species where it's relatively moist, where they're deeper soils and surface fires are the common fire regime. And you have animals that are basically forest birds and rodents. Now, as climates began to dry and the other genera were being uh, selected for, they, they're basically shrubs and small trees. They, they occupy shrublands. They're relatively dry systems compared to the woodlands. They're shallow soils. Because they're short, they only have canopy fires. And they have a different array of birds and rodents that occupy them. So you've got two fairly different systems, even though they don't seem that they would be that distinct from one another. So we're going to focus for the next part just on what flowers and fruits and seedling characters might change based upon a shift from woodlands to chaparral or any kind of dry uh, shrubland system. So on the right, um, a large mission manzanita before a fire and re-sprouting after a fire. It turns out all of the plants, all the genera re-sprout, so that's an ancestral character. And another ancestral character is that the fruits are fleshy. But as you noticed when I was introducing the groups, a lot of the genera, three of them, have dry fruit. Okay. So it's thought that maybe summer drought might be a, a selective force for that. Um, inside the fruit, there are some differences too. You can eat an Arbutus fruit and your teeth will survive quite well. But if you try to bite into a manzanita fruit, you're gonna start chipping your teeth because the seeds are covered with uh, thickened endocarps that are nut-like. So imagine eating a peach and you try to eat the peach pit at the same time. That's a thickened endocarp. And those usually occur when rodents are eating too much of the seed and um, thickened endocarps are selected. We also have seeds that are called transient for most of the genera. And that just means they germinate within a year or they tend to be consumed or lose viability. You get to Arctostaphylus and you have dormant seed that are fire stimulated. So it's a really different um, kind of character. And also in Arctostaphylus, you have obligate seeding, like we talked about for Montero Ensa, so there's no burl, but all the other plants lack that character. Um, and what I want you to do is now just look at the blue words and you can see some of the features that are the principal selective forces in this um, subfamily. The, the severe summer drought or seasonality of drought, because um, in Mexico it flips to winter drought. Um, 
rodent seed predation on the, the fruit and fire. So you guys are from California, you probably know that those are all important issues. But if we just look at the traits, you've got um, fleshy fruit in two of the genera and dry fruit in the other three. And we're gonna skip Arctos from now on and just concentrate on the ones that are in the uh, California floristic province. The endocarps are thin in madrones, but even in Coomerostaphylis and all the other genera, you have those thickened uh, endocarps. And if you actually looked at them in Arbutus, so the, you can separate all the seed quite readily from the fruit. In Coomerostaphylis, Ornithostaphylis, Xylococcus, and some of the Arctostaphylis species, all of those stony nutlets, little tiny nuts, are fused together into a single structure. In Arctostaphylis, though, you also have species where some, some of the nutlets are separate. The seeds are transient in all the groups except for Arctostaphylis. So what that means is there are seed in the soil beneath Arctostaphylis um, that are persistent and they're stimulated only by fire. And finally, when the plants do experience fire, all the genera have re-sprouts that are possible and Arctostaphylis only at about a third of them. And in Arctostaphylis, you also have the obligate cedars that are killed by fire. And they completely depend upon those dormant seed in the soil. So you can see there's a transition, a stepwise shifts among the different genera um, that are basically stages in my mind to get the Arctostaphylis, but in reality, each one of these genera are doing their own thing. Just to show you what some of these look like, Arbutus on the far left with a succulent fleshy uh, fruit. In the center is a Coomerostaphylis fruit. It's not mature, so it's green, but it's a succulent fruit there. And then the dry fruit of Arctostaphylis on the far right. At the bottom, I just have cleared off the fruit and just left the seed with the endocarps. Um, and you can see the separate small things from Arbutus. Coomerostaphylis, they're all fused together into a single structure. And on the left side of Arctostaphylis is big berry manzanita. And those are all fused together, but there are others that are fused. And then the partial fusion and complete separation that you can sometimes find in some species of Arctostaphylis. That's a very thumbnail sketch of a lot of the shifts that have occurred in this group. So let's think about where the thickened endocarps came from. And I already told you, it's rodents eating the seed. And it's a common thing for uh, granivores selecting on seed um, to cause uh, plants to be selected for thickened endocarps. Where did that dry fruit come from? That's a more interesting question. Uh, we have all those uh, succulent fruit, but all of the more modern genera in terms of um, the sequence of evolution from the um, tree, the phylogenetic tree, uh, they all have dry fruit at maturity. Well, just think about what our climate is like. The summer started drying um, 15 million years ago. The picture on the left side shows you what the current summer drying looks like. The red line is Los Angeles County. Um, where it's pretty warm in the summer, which are the lines peaking in the middle there. Um, at the bottom, there's no rain anywhere. The blue dotted line is Marin County, um, Monterey and San Luis Obispo counties are the other two lines. So there might be differences in the average summer temperature, but nobody has rain in the summer. So that summer drying is, is an issue for succulent fruit. If you have summer droughts that are extensive for plants to keep putting a lot of moisture into a large fruit crop means they're sacrificing some of the water that they need just to survive. So fruit shifts to drying fruit is not an uncommon condition among plants. You know a whole bunch of those. For example, in one genus of the rose family, the genus Prunus, 
You eat cherries, plums, and peaches all the time, and those have their origin from mesic temperate areas, but you also eat almonds, and those are from semi-arid areas. Notice they have dry fruit. We have three different um, prunus species in California that occur in our deserts, and they're called the desert peach, the desert almond, and the desert plum, but they all have dry fruit uh, at maturity. So having dry fruit is a common occurrence in a lot of plant lineages if the plant populations are experiencing severe droughts. Another cool thing is to just look at differences in flowering because now if you're going to have dry fruit, um, you can flower, you're going to have to flower at different times to get it to mature before it's too dry. Um, and all of the genera, except for Cumarostavlis and Arbutus, which have mesic fruit, um, they've, they've shifted their time of flowering to an earlier time period. So Arctostaphylis will start flowering in January and Feb or December sometimes. Um, so will Xylococcus and Ornithostaphylis if they've had uh, moisture. But Cumarostaphylis and Arbutus are delayed a little bit, but the, the real key thing is the fruit when they mature. So these graphs you're looking at are just scoring herbarium sheets from um, a couple of thousand herbarium sheets. Really fun. But what you can see is um, the manzanitas, the mission manzanita, the Baja bird bush, uh, they, their fruit matures in the late spring to the early summer, whereas um, the two succulent fruit or fleshy fruited species matures in the fall. The other question I've always liked to think about is where did that obligate seeding come from? Complete reliance now on seeds emerging from the soil after a fire. Great time to be a seedling. Nobody else is grabbing moisture from the soil. Nobody else is grabbing all those minerals that have been added by the ash from the fire. So it's really an ideal location, especially with the high sunlight, which gives you plenty of energy. Um, so let's think about how seeds get around. Um, carnivorous mammals will disperse manzanita fruit. But if you look and see where they deposit that fruit, that's not a happy place uh, for seed if a wildfire comes through. So if you're on the surface <coughs> of the soil, the temperatures of the fire will make all of those seed inviolable. But we do have friends, and those friends are those evil rodents that eat the seed because they're scatter hoarders and they will bury fruit and come back to it later to consume if, if they can come back to it. Their friends may have already moved the fruit. A rodent might have succumbed to a coyote or to a rattlesnake and the seeds survive in the soil. On the left, what you're looking at is a cache from rodents where there's about 25 or 30 different manzanita seedlings emerging from that cache. Uh, post fire. So that's cool because what it means is now you've got animals taking seed and burying it. And once you start burying the seed, the seed is now getting to depths in the soil where they can survive a wildfire. And that becomes an interesting place if plants come up with the right combination of genes and dormancy can be selected for, then you end up with a wonderful condition of having persistent seed banks. So let's make sure they bury them deep enough and you can do experiments. So what you're looking at is a pizza pan with uh, fluorescent powder and in the center a Petri dish with a bunch of manzanita fruit. And we just put that down in uh, a lot of places in a um, stand of chaparral. You follow the fluorescent trails, the drag of tail in that case, back to places where there's a pile of fluorescent powder on the ground and you dig up the caches and you find out if they've buried them deep enough to survive a wildfire. So let's take a look at this. 
This is a soil profile. The surface is at the top. <clears throat> you go from shallow near the top to deeper down below. When you have a wildfire, now fires are quite variable, but nonetheless, at the surface, there's going to be a kill zone. The temperatures will exceed 120 Celsius, and I can't convert that to Fahrenheit, but it's hot. And after 120 Celsius, even manzanita seeds lose viability. So they have to be buried below that kill zone. And sure enough, it turns out digging up those caches that the average distribution is well below uh, that kill zone. A lot of the seeds are in the kill zone, but most of them are, are below it. So the rodents are now doing perfect dispersal in the sense that they're getting them below uh, the kill zone of wildfires. So you've got rodents bearing its seed, and in the context of wildfire with those high temperatures, you end up selecting for seed dormancy. And it only arose in Arctostaphylus. Silococcus didn't pick it up, Ornithostaphylus didn't pick it up. Um, but now you have a condition where obligate seeding uh, can be selected for because you've got dormant seed. And now the plants that um, survive the fire and seeds come up, uh, about a third of the manzanitas, um, the genetic turnover in their populations is pretty slow because of the high survival of the fire. But if you have obligate seeding, every time there's a fire, the plants are rolling the dice genetically for who's going to make it. And so they have the opportunity to evolve at a faster rate. And that could be why two thirds of the genus are obligate seeders. So let's kind of summarize what we've got. Um, historically, you've got fleshy fruit and um, obligate uh, resprouting ability. A little bit later, thickened into carps, uh, those nuts that are conate, and all that means is they're fused together. After that point, for the three genera to the bottom there, they end up with dry fruit rather than fleshy fruit. And that means they've had to move their flowering and fruit maturation into the summer. And that's kind of convenient because if the rodents bury it in a timely manner, the typical fires historically were in September. That's where the peak burn period was. We don't seem to have a typical fire period at, at the moment, but that's what they were selected by. And when you get to that last lineage, now they've got seed dormancy and persistent seed banks and that permitted obligate seeding. So one way to think about all of these characters in terms of what's selected for them, you've got to, one group of animals, birds, that are dispersing succulent fruit. You've got rodents that are influencing the thickening of endocarps, the fusion of those endocarps into structures to defeat those rodents. But the summers are also asking for dry fruit, but rodents are, um, will select for dry fruit to eat the seeds from. And that's also selecting for summer fruit maturation. You have aridity on those two characters as well, those last two characters, and fire regimes acting as well. So there you can see uh, kind of the summary of what's happening to all these different plants. Um, different bird and rodent communities in forests and woodlands versus uh, shrublands. Um, different climates in terms of aridity and different fire regimes. And all of those end up selecting for different sets of characters. So if you're in Northern California, Coomerostaphylus, Ornithostaphylus, and Xylococcus may not be very familiar to you. But as soon as you get to Santa Barbara County, you start picking up um, these different species. And it's worth looking at them and putting them in the context of a gigantic evolutionary history. So, a little summary, this is a small and early subfamily of a family of plants that you're very familiar with, rhododendrons and blueberries and cranberries and all sorts of different groups. Lots of shifts in climates that have influences, changes in life forms and in just the six genera that we're looking at. Climate drying modified the fire regimes that they're experiencing. Um, plants ended up in different habitats. 
And that changes the animal community, that's their context. And that ended up with the climate changing fruits from fleshy to dry. And then lots of other shifts in Arctostaphylis we can go into at some other point. So evolution in this group is really a dance among climate and fire regimes and animals. And it's reciprocal. You don't end up with just one thing happening at a time. All of these are acting simultaneously. And the way I'd like you to think about it is a subtle shift in one of those features is not happening isolated. It's happening in the context of the others. So you end up with subtle shifts in animal communities, and that might modify uh, the plants a little bit. But if the climate is also changing, that might be uh, a more dominant feature at that point. So it's kind of cool to think about um, the, the sensitivity of, of all of these different features that we've been talking about. So that's what I wanted to talk about today, not merely manzanitas, and not much about manzanitas, but to really put it in a context for you, uh, just the subfamily, the Arbutoidae, and the fact that um, you have a group of trees, Arbutus, um, that has led to a series of smaller plants in different kinds of habitats that ended up with very different kinds of reproductive features as well as other features. We didn't go into the leaves, uh, the physiology, the wood structure, things like that, but there are changes in each one of those areas. But just looking at the reproductive structures alone, you can see the impact of the animal communities, the climate, and shifts in the fire regimes. Oh, thanks for listening. I cut out another 45 slides to keep this a reasonable time, and I'm happy to answer questions. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, let's see what we have in the, que uh, in the questions here. Um, can you see them as well? I can see them. <clears throat> uh -oh. okay, so it says from Vince, it says, are the burrows sometimes buried? Seems so, so do you need to dig sometimes in order to verify the ID? Hi Vince, um, the burrows, if you're on a slope, um, you always look uphill, because if you look downhill, the debris tends to bury the, the burrows if it's a steep slope and it's an old stand. Um, if you're high in the mountains, sometimes they're not very obvious either, like an Arctostaphylus patula. Um, so yeah, sometimes you do need to dig and it can be tricky sometimes. So the best thing to do is to look at a lot of different individuals. Um, anonymous attendee, how do you tell crustacea from another uh, subspecies of crustacea? It's mostly by pubescence patterns, hairs. Um, so you need a hand lens um, a lot of times. Uh, Meredith Nielsen says, I'm not familiar with the term clade. Could you explain that? And that's basically when uh, you're looking at a tree of evolution and you have a branch that goes off that then further branches, that becomes a clade or a lineage is another word you could think of. So that's all um, I was meaning by that. So in Arctostaphylus, you have two separate lineages um, that you can also call uh, clade. Um, Mary Ellen Hannibal. Um, Manzanita is in California, definitely a biodiversity hotspot, and we have an unusually uh, diverse flora for the surface area of the state. Um, the five Mediterranean areas are biodiversity hotspots and the only uh, non tropical hotspots that have been designated. The fruits edible, yes. Um, they're not very tasty. The Arbutus fruits are edible. The French for sure, and some of the Italians make um, jellies and things like that from them. You probably want to add a little sugar. Uh, I haven't tasted Xylococcus or Coumarostaphylis, but um, Arctostaphylis 
species. The, uh, the outer skin is quite tasty in some of them and less so in others. Uh, but you can make teas and Native Americans did all sorts of stuff with them. <coughs> um, North American continent glaciations, Mary Ellen Hannibal. Uh, the best one is by a, um, hmm, uh, it's called uh, After the Ice Age um, by uh, Elizabeth P. Lou, a uh, Canadian statistician. <laughs> But it's a great book and it's very readable for, uh, it's a non-scientific oriented book, all about science. Um, talking about the glaciers and the non-glacial periods and her position was that we're basically in an unusual uh, minor time period right now, the interglacial. No clue, Arvid, about um, smooth bark versus rough bark. <laughs> uh, I've asked physicists to explain why they feel cool to the human hand compared to rough bark and um, no one can give me a good answer. Uh, Tammy Amarge, um, soil preferences of manzanitas. Um, some manzanitas are willing to live anywhere on any sort of soil type. Others are highly restricted. So um, there's one called Arctostaphylus gabalonensis, which occurs in the Gabalon Mountains, but only on granite, which means it's just to the north of the Pinnacles and then uh, on some granite outcrops near Fremont Peak. And that's the only place you find it. Um, on Mount Tamalpais, Arctostaphylus montana, the Tamalpais manzanita is only on serpentine. So there's a lot of plants with very distinct soil preferences. Others are willing to grow in all sorts of places. Tom, as you go along answering the questions, people want to know what the question is because they're not catching the question. Got it, okay. So if you could repeat that before the reply, yeah. Yeah, it's a problem I always have. So Carrie Olson is asking any propagation tips for Arctostaphylus and horticulturalists could give you um, a better idea, but basically um, just before the winter, after the first rain, but before the new growth uh, is what I've been told, you make a cutting lot of root hormone um, in sand with um, heating underneath. Um, that tends to work, it takes a long time. Um, Margaret Goodale asks, is there anywhere to find our local Montana mountain species, the plant in a garden? That I'm not sure of, but um, I would guess it's a very beautiful plant that somebody has cultivated it. Um, but I know there are horticulturalists out there that would know places. Um, Colleen Ingram asks, um, WRT, well, so I'm not good at that, to the big small clades and the uh, tetraploids. Can you tell us what we're looking at uh, with the species on San Bruno Mountain? Oof. Okay, San Bruno Mountain, you've got Arctostaphylus uberursi of different morphologies. Um, so if you stop at the last parking lot at the top and you start walking the fire road, Above you is a very coarse-leaved uva ursi that's just very similar to the one that's in Guatemala. Um, but there are burls inter intermittently up in, in that uva ursi. So uva ursi has populations with and without burls. But if you stop more toward Kamchaka Point, if you know that, you get more typical um, northern thin-leaved ones. So. The other uh, San Bruno Mountain species are um, Arctostaphylus crustacea of tetraploid that you have to go closer to um, Brisbane to see. Um, there's um, the, the endemic to San Bruno Mountain, um, Imbricata, and there's a few tall ones that would end up being uh, Montera ensis. So there it is. Ralph. Tom, yeah? is your book still in print? Um, it is, but we're 
starting on a second edition. So, uh, but there's only like 20 or 30 copies left. So if you want to get one, you have to go fast. Ah. Then, then another edition will come out eventually. Right. So Ralph Shanks asks if the book covers the same material. So it goes into detail about Manzanitas, barely covers the Arbutoidae um, uh, like that. Uh, Michael McGill asks, of the Arctostaphylus species native to the Santa Cruz Mountains, are any expected to be severely impacted by the recent CZU fires? And is Arctostaphylus silvicola, the Bonnie Dune silverleaf, an obligate cedar or re-sprouter? So the Bonnie Dune area uh, burned about 10, 11 years ago, and silvicola came back great. It is a obligate cedar and did not re-sprout. Um, Arctostaphylus andersonii is an obligate cedar and is also there and has come back really well. Um, Crustacea is a sprouter that you have to get to the thinner soils, like where the sandy sandstone hills uh, break out and you can see Crustacea, or to the south um, if you follow some of the trails. Uh, there's also Arctostaphylus sensitiva from the Little Clade, and it is also an obligate cedar and did quite well after that fire. Um, I don't think the plants are going to be severely impacted by the fire, except that their populations will be highly modified because the adults will die or will start re-sprouting and you need good rain for them to recover, but it seems like we're going to get a good rain this weekend. Um, Ralph Larson asks, are there any geographical or ecological differences between the two Manzanita clades? Um, there does seem to be, and it seems like the little clade is more mesic than the larger clade, in that uh, the little clade includes uh, the greenleaf Manzanita, which is in the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada, but at the, you know, above the snow line. Um, the coastal species are all maritime, so they get the summer fog. Um, you don't find any uh, little clade species that don't have that kind of um, extra moisture in their environment. Otherwise, um, both clades are pretty widespread, but most of the big clade are restricted to um, California, except for um, Columbiana, which goes all the way from Sonoma County north to British Columbia. Bing Huey asks, are there detectable phenological changes within recent time periods with the climate changes? Um, actually, I have looked at phenology for the past hundred years and um, Arctostaphylus has not changed at all. And I think that's because uh, warming from climate change is going to uh, influence populations that respond to uh, spring temperatures. Manzanitas respond to rain. And I think that's the limiting feature to stimulates rainfall for them. So we haven't, at least phenologically, I haven't seen that. Um, Diana Balter asks, why do barks peel and sometimes peel off? Do they have tannins in the bark, red like redwoods, or galls part of their environment? Um, they peel off because the stems are growing, and as they grow, they enlarge. And as they enlarge, the bark is, is dead material, and it breaks apart. So they have to grow new bark under it, and as um, they grow the new bark, the old bark peels off. Um, that doesn't always happen with plants, you know, Think about a ponderosa pine, the old bark is sometimes still there, but you have those deep crevasses that tell you that the old bark was not enough to cover the, the new uh, circumference of the larger stem. Uh, there are definitely tannins in the bark, and galls are common in the fruit, but um, uh, aphid galls are common on the leaves, but I've not seen any other kind of galls um, on manzanitas. Ooh, you guys ask a lot of questions. <laughs> Laura Baker asks, uh, how do these evolutionary forces affect the pollinating community? Any general observations? Up here in Sonoma County, we see native bees and flies 
right now appearing on uh, Columbiana. Um, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, the, the flowers are all fairly similar. Um, bumblebees would be important and the small native bees would be important. Uh, there have been some studies in Arizona that suggest uh, little the little tiny uh, bug-like organisms that are look like commas. I can't remember their actual name at the moment, but you sometimes see them in the flowers. They actually do move pollen. Um, I've seen hummingbirds. Um, uh, other people have observed uh, moths and butterflies. I haven't seen those, but I've seen lots of uh, native bees. Um, I had a student studying uh, phenology in Monterey County. They were too close to agriculture and it was overwhelmingly dominated by honeybees. So. Um, Anis Humbra on uh, A. Glauca. Yeah, I, ha I haven't gotten to the chats yet. I'm still in uh, questioning. Yes, yes. yes. I know it just popped up. But there is, there is one question I ought to ask you, which is the one that came in before you started your lecture. And that has to do with the rare manzanita, the, the Franciscana uh, that was found on the side of the Golden Gate Bridge approach. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Deidre and Jerry Crow wanted to know about this rare manzanita. They say it was about three years ago and whether it's being propagated. Um, so that was about 12 years ago and it got moved to another part of the Presidio. Um, they didn't move the entire plant um, because it was too big. Um, it was a single individual, but they had this one area that went way downhill and they took all of that, um, chopped it up and sent it to five different places for propagation and it was very successful. Um, and the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden still has a lot of those clones. Um, the Presidia has planted a ton of those clones, um, especially along Lincoln Avenue on the ser serpentine outcrops on the cliffs overlooking um, the Golden Gate. Um, you probably could have, could purchase one if you want from uh, the San, San Francisco Botanic Garden. I have two in my yard and they don't mind not being on serpentine. So that works. The original plant was still alive last I looked. So. Thank you. Um, Anonymous attendee says, your evolution chart seems to show that manzanitas are related to European arbutus species, but not to our own madrone. Uh, how could this be? Well, that's been a challenge ever since we first saw that. And um, our speculation is that um, the Western and Mexican madrones um, were one lineage and everybody else was a separate lineage. Um, and they still all look like madrones. Um, that lineage split into a group moving into uh, Eurasia, uh, basically the Mediterranean, and they still look like madrones. Um, but the other split um, turned into all the other genera. Um, right now, it's, it's a model of what happened. Um, we need more data uh, until you want to run around changing names of things. Um, there is a publication from 2001 that, that goes into it in terms of a, a little more story. Um, Philip McNally asks, how would you compare the evolution of Arctostaphylus species in California versus Arizona as the summer rainfall is, is vastly different? Um, Arizona has two different rainfall periods, winter and um, thunderstorms in the summer. Um, it has two different manzanitas, um, one of which uh, California has, Arctostaphylus pungens, the Mexican manzanita. And then it has one that's only found in Arizona, um, Pringles manzanita, Arctostaphylus pringlii. We have a 
odd subspecies of Pringlei in Southern California with a very different looking fruit. Um, yeah, they have different rainfall patterns, <coughs> um, but it doesn't seem to be impacting um, the plants at this point the, uh, in a negative or positive way. Uh, the summer rainfall would be relieving it of any kind of uh, severe drought, but the summer rains are often patchy. Um, and I haven't studied that too much, so I'll confess ignorance for the rest of it. Eileen Campbell asks, are there characteristics of each clay that would make them recognizable? So if I'm walking somewhere and see two different species, I could say, oh, these two clades. We always hoped for that, and it does not exist. Um, and I think that's because um, the little clade is pretty uniform to the, a great extent, and that the leaves um, are smooth and green and tend to look like footballs. Um, they're always in moist habitats. Um, but then the big clade has a lot of species that look just like that as well, uh, as well as a lot of species that are quite very different. Um, the big clade has um, bracts associated with the flowers that are often quite large. They're referred to as leaf-like, but small. Um, whereas the little clade is uniformly scale-like. Um, the trouble is the big clade also has scale-like bracts in some species. So no, there's no, <laughs> no good characters. You just have to know them. Okay, thank you, Michael McGill. Ooh, chat box. <laughs> <laughs> We're making you, you know, work here, right? After after your presentation, just take a breath <laughs> before you hit the chat box. Oh no, this is good. This is good. All right. Aha, the cuffs on uh, cuffs on the side. Good. So, okay. can, can you see the chat? I am. I'm all the way down to Emma Jane Shelton. Okay. And she likes the Kings Mountain Manzanita, and I do too. Um, that's a really big one. Unfortunately, I, I collected them off the road, 35, and most of those are gone due to um, fuel management along the road. What um, Barbara Kluger asks, uh, what effects do you think changing climate extremes will have on these species, particularly in view of the last part of what you were discussing? Um, the evolutionary dance between climate animals and fire. Um, so I've already seen changes and in Northern California, all of those gigantic fires um, have resulted in beautiful recovery, even though the plants are quite small. And that's because there was good rainfall. Um, the Thomas fire in Southern California um, happened during a drought and the next spring was a drought. And there was no rain until March, and they got a big rain, and then nothing after that. Um, seedlings came up, and then they died from the drought. And then the next year was a reasonable rain, but not that great. Um, and there was another response, but um, again, the ability to survive the fires is highly reduced. So the plants are not replacing um, the adults that uh, died in the fire. That's also true for a small fire near Lompoc. Um, and that happened to have a, a yet another, so that one's not as old. It had a really good response this last spring, but when did they get rain? <laughs> um, yeah, they're only just getting a decent rain now. So I don't know if those seedlings have survived because um, that's been almost a year since they were up and running. Let's see, uh, Veronica uh, Pitblado asks if I can recommend a book on manzanitas and family. Um, well, I co-authored a book called Field Guide to Manzanitas and has a little story up front about um, some of the things we covered 
uh, in the talk. And the rest of the book is about how to identify them and find them. Um, and that's yeah. available either directly through you or can you find it on Amazon or somewhere or? Um, find it on uh, backcountrypress.com or org, whatever it might be. Backcountry Press? Yeah. Yep, Humboldt County. Uh, I cannot explain the evolutionary re reason for the smooth bark, Arvin. Um, Philip McNally asks, how would you compare the evolution of Arctic staff? Oh, we've already done that one, thank good. Um, okay, are there any other questions? <laughs> I think I've gotten through everything. If I didn't answer your question, let me know right now. Yes, please do. <laughs> Tom Farker has gone through them with the speed of lightning and, and efficiency. So, um, um, well, it seems as though. Everyone's worn out. <laughs> Everyone, yes, yes. And uh, comments are about and thanking you and uh, great talk and so on and so forth. So again, thank you so much for Pleasure. joining us and, uh, and thank you for a fascinating talk. I hope you enjoyed it. All right, well, take care and enjoy San Diego. Thank you. <laughs> All right, take care then. Bye-bye.